Hello and welcome to this new episode on the Indian National Army. Whenever we talk about the Indian National Army, we invariably associate it uh, with Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Although many of us know that uh, before Netaji reached Southeast Asia, an INA already existed, but we are not quite familiar with its full story. We don't hear much about it because the first INA could not achieve much. Yet, it is a fascinating story with many lessons. It is a story of a long time dream coming true and then quickly falling flat. It is a story of patriotism, courage, determination and the desperation to free the country from colonial rule. But it is also a story of how a big dream can be failed through jealousy, mutual distrust, hankering for power and indecisiveness. Above all, it is a story of how an able leadership can make all the difference in converting a dream into reality. Although the first INA was set up in September 1942, the story of the INA and the surrounding movement began towards the end of 1941. To be precise, in October 1941, when Major E.Y. Fujiwara was sent by the 8th section of the 2nd Bureau of the Imperial General Headquarters to Bangkok. His primary brief was to help the military attaché in Bangkok, Colonel Tamura, but the more detailed brief was an assessment of the British Indian Army in Southeast Asia and to contact the anti-British organizations, including the organizations which were fighting for India's freedom. Fujiwara had a team of 15 people with him and this team subsequently came to be known as F. Kikan or Fujiwara Kikan. Soon after Fujiwara arrived in Bangkok, on 5th November, the Japanese cabinet decided that they would go to war against the US, the UK and the Dutch. The same cabinet meeting also decided that Japan would help organize a movement for India's freedom in Southeast Asia. Major Fujiwara was introduced to Gyani Pritam Singh by Colonel Tamura. Pritam Singh, who had been living in Thailand from 1933, headed an organization called Independence League of India. In 1940, he was joined by Baba Amar Singh, who came out after a long prison term. Over a period of time, Pritam Singh had been able to build up a solid underground network, who worked secretly for India's independence. The partnership between Pritam Singh and Fujiwara clicked very well, and after some initial negotiation, they reached an agreement. The Independence League of India would fight for India's freedom and would be given overall support by Japan. But in return, Japan would not ask from India any kind of concession, be it political, military, economic or territorial. Singh's organization would move along with the Japanese army and contact the Indian soldiers in the British Indian army, run propaganda amongst them. Thus, they would help build a relationship between the Japanese army and the Indian soldiers and raise a volunteer force from amongst the officers and men in the British Indian Army and the civilians in the Southeast Asian countries. In return, Japan would not treat the captured Indian soldiers or uh, Indians in the captured territories as enemy and would allow Independence League of India to broadcast from their radio stations in Tokyo and Bangkok. Besides, the Japanese would provide all the resources that would be required for this work. At the very early stage, Pritham Singh asked Fujiwara to make arrangement for Subhash Chandra Bose to be brought to Southeast Asia so that he can give leadership to the entire movement. In fact, Fujiwara was surprised to hear the name of Subhash Bose from almost everyone he met. He was very impressed with the way Indians looked up to him and they thought that if he comes to Southeast Asia, then it will get a new momentum. A memorandum containing these terms was signed between Pritam Singh and Colonel Tamura on the 4th of December 1941. Just a few days later, on 8th December, the Japanese forces landed in Thailand. As agreed, Singh and Fujiwara continued to travel with the Japanese forces uh, towards the south of Thailand. And as they moved, they kept on setting up new branches of the Independence League of India. Small groups of the league started visiting the fronts with members of the Fujiwara Kikan. After Fujiwara and Singh reached Alorstar on the 14th of December, they received a message from Mohan Singh, who belonged to the 1 by 14 Punjab Regiment that was completely overrun by the Japanese forces. Trained in the Indian Military Academy in Dehradun, 
Mohan Singh had been commissioned to the army in 1934. By the time he reached Malaya in 1941, he had already turned bitter against his British superiors. Realization dawned upon him that there was a difference between being a soldier of a free country and being a soldier of a subject nation. The military disaster precipitated his inner conflict between being loyal to his commission and being loyal to his own country. He decided to take the unprecedented step of approaching the Japanese, seeking their help to start a movement for India's independence. Mohan Singh and Captain Akram met Fujiwara for the first time on the 15th of December. Mohan Singh wanted to be absolutely clear that the Japanese had no evil design on India. He was conscious of the requirement for a political leadership of the movement. But rather than having a local leader lead the movement, he insisted that the Japanese should bring Subhash Chandra Bose to Southeast Asia. So it's quite clear that both the civilians and the Indian Army, the officers of the Indian Army, they were acutely aware of what Netaji was doing in Berlin and they wanted him in Southeast Asia. Mohan Singh was not quite convinced in his initial discussion with uh, Major Fujiwara. Fujiwara therefore arranged a meeting between Mohan Singh and Lieutenant General Yamashita, the commander of the Malayan campaign. This was a more productive meeting and Lieutenant General Yamashita promised to Mohan Singh to hand over the control of all the Indian prisoners of war. The relationship between Mohan Singh and the Japanese grew stronger but he was still not ready to commit to a collaboration. There were various factors that he had to take into account. He did not know Pritam Singh that well. He was concerned how the Congress leaders in India would react to such a collaboration. And above all, he was still not sure how to convince the officers and the men from the British Indian Army who were not prisoners of war about the sincerity of the Japanese. But while the negotiations went on, Mohan Singh started organizing the prisoners of war. The communal kitchen system was disbanded and a common mess was started. A training program was started with lectures on patriotism, politics and communal unity. Towards the end of December, Mohan Singh communicated to the Japanese that he was ready to raise an army, provided they accepted his conditions. These conditions were that the Japanese army should give full cooperation for raising a liberation army for India, that the Independence League of India and the army would function independently. The Japanese army should allow the Indian prisoners of war to be controlled by Mohan Singh and that the Japanese would give the proposed liberation army the status of an allied army. Fujiwara forwarded Mohan Singh's demands to the 25th army commander under Field Marshal Tarauchi and asked Mohan Singh to carry on with propaganda amongst the prisoners of war till a decision was reached to which Mohan Singh agreed. It was during this time that the proposed army got its name. Fujiwara accepted Mohan Singh's suggestion of Indian National Army over his own suggestion of volunteers for Indian freedom. Fujiwara also took an initiative on his part to ascertain the views of the prisoners of war regarding the raising of an army. A committee was formed to deliberate on the points referred to by Fujiwara and it was decided by this committee of the POWs that a liberation army should be raised. The most striking aspect of the decision of the committee was its views on political leadership. Now we have to keep in mind that these are people who were in the army, in the British Indian Army till a few days ago and what we are going to hear about their views on political leadership to the new movement is quite revealing and quite sensational. The committee also wanted as their leader Subhash Chandra Bose. They communicated to Fujiwara that we consider it a point of great honor for us to accept the kind, valuable and venerable leadership of Mr. S.C. Bose. We all know that he is an extremist who believes in revolutions and radical changes. People in India are most anxiously waiting for any movement started by Mr. Bose. He is a leader whose name will start up a great revolution amongst Indian masses, which would have a strong reaction in the Indian army. It will cause a split in the Indian National Congress circles and the majority of the Congress will join Mr. Bose. We, the members of the Indian National Army, are prepared to shed every drop of our blood for Mr. S.C. Bose. His very name puts new life into us. The day Mr. S.C. Bose's name comes before us, 
we promise that if it suits our purpose, we will openly condemn the Indian National Congress. Now, this is a radical point of view coming from people who have been trained and were fighting as soldiers of the British Indian Army. But everything was not going smoothly. The Japanese had still not accepted Mohan Singh's conditions. And they were looking upon the army that was to be formed as a tool for propaganda, not as a fighting force. They were to be used for propaganda, police work and reconstruction. The Japanese wanted to send some units from the POWs to the ensuing campaigns in Singapore, Sumatra and Burma. Although Mohan Singh agreed to lend some troops for the Singapore and Burma campaigns, he refused to lend any soldier for the Sumatra campaign. Accordingly, two groups, one under Major Ram Swarup, was sent to Burma and a second one under Captain Allah Ditta was sent to Singapore. British positions continued to fall under the advancing Japanese forces. Ipo, Kampar, Kuala Lumpur, Johar Baru and finally on 15 February, Singapore fell. The fall of Kuala Lumpur and Singapore resulted in 3.5 thousand and 45 thousand Indian prisoners of war respectively. In a meeting held at Farrar Park in Singapore, Major Fujiwara accepted the surrender of these troops and announced that the Indian prisoners of war will be under the control of Mohan Singh. And it was here that Mohan Singh formally announced his plan to raise a liberation army. The announcement was received with great enthusiasm from the rank and file, but except for the officers who took a very cautious approach. Neither did they trust the Japanese nor did they have much faith on Mohan Singh's ability to lead such an army. According to some estimates, at this time, there were 55,000 Indian prisoners of war under Mohan Singh's control. The immediate task in front of Mohan Singh was now to organize this huge number of POWs. He set up a POW headquarters in Nisun in Singapore under Lieutenant Colonel Niranjan Singh Gill with Lieutenant Colonel J.K. Bhosle as the adjutant and the quartermaster general and Lieutenant Colonel A.C. Chatterjee as the director of medical services. The Indian POWs were housed in five camps in Singapore. Mohan Singh continued his efforts to gain as much support as possible from these POWs. The fall of Singapore also unleashed the latent forces of Indian nationalism across East and Southeast Asia. In Japan, Rashbi Haribos swung into action to give lead to this movement. He started a series of broadcasts directed towards Indians, Indian leaders of all shades of opinion, to refuse support to the British government. At the same time, he contacted the Japanese government, to which he was pretty close and well known, to help raise a movement in East Asia. The Japanese Prime Minister Hideki Tojo announced his famous phrase, India for Indians, on 16 February, the very next day after Singapore fell. Rajbiari set up the headquarters of Indian Independence League in Tokyo, issued a manifesto and started preparations for a conference in Tokyo of representatives from, from all the Japanese occupied territories. There were already a number of organizations of Indians across Southeast Asia, but most of them were quite apprehensive of the intentions of the Japanese. This was a difficult situation. They were cautious not to antagonize the Japanese, but also very careful about protecting their own interests. Historian K.K. Ghosh has pointed out that their inherent attitude was more anti-Japanese than anti-British. In this context, Rashbihari was the only leader who was actively seeking the support from Japan. The leaders of the Indian communities in Malaya, Singapore and Thailand met on 9th and 10th March to decide on the plan of action. There were two key issues that they were worried about and wanted to discuss. First, it was whether they really wanted the Indian communities to get drawn into this conflict to start the movement which really hinged on Japan's own interest in the Pacific War. And the second question was more ethical, moral, whether non-violence was a justified means. A section of the leaders argued that it was imperative to have the approval from the International Congress 
before committing to raise an army and since it was not possible to obtain that approval or even the opinion from the congress they decided to send a goodwill mission to the tokyo conference rather than sending delegates an accident at this time came as a big setback to the nascent movement while traveling to tokyo to attend the conference gyani pritam singh and swami satyanand puri died in a plane crash at the tokyo conference which was held from 28th to 30th march rashbihari was put forward as the leader of the upcoming movement by the indian community in japan by the by a very strong civilian group in japan and also by the imperial japanese headquarters his proximity to the japanese created an air of suspicion amongst the attendees from southeast asia leaders such as kpk menon sc goho and n raghavan were apprehensive that the japanese would try to push their agenda through a compliant rashbihari in fact mohan singh later described rashbihari bose as a well known japanese puppet the conference decided that all the small nationalist organizations strewn across southeast asia across east asia would merge into the indian independence league and would be set up as branches of iil iil would have a large broad based committee of representatives which in turn would elect the supreme decision making council known as the council of action rashbihari was elected as the president of the council of action rangoon had followed by this time the allied forces were retreating and the japanese forces were knocking on the eastern boundaries of india however the deep seated distrust of the japanese prevented the indian leaders in the tokyo conference to agree on the raising of the ina since the indian national congress stood for non violence the conference decided that the army could not be raised without their explicit approval going further the conference made the cooperation of the indian movement with the japanese forces conditional on the latter's assurance on the following points that the japanese government would make an independent declaration expressing its readiness to help india attain complete independence and guaranteeing its full sovereignty it would also promise that the framing of the future constitution of india will be left entirely to the representatives of the people of india it should provide financial assistance to the indian independence league in a manner and to the extent requested by the council of action this assistant would be treated as a loan and would be repaid by india after independence the government of japan should clarify the position of the indian troops now under their control in occupied territories recognize and facilitate the use of the present national flag of india in all territories under the imperial government of japan and consult in all matters of administration affecting the indian community the indian independence league of the respective places as a safeguard against armed action against india even by the indian national army the tokyo conference uh, decided that before taking any military action against india contrary to the wishes policy or opinion of the indian national congress the council of action shall first get the approval of the committee of representatives and act as directed so the hands of the council of action were tied to the decision taken by the broad based committee of representatives the coa was prevented from taking any unilateral action the conference was also very careful about not allowing the japanese forces to lead the invasion into india the resolution that it passed on this point was that the military action against india should be taken only by the indian national army and under the command of indians together with such military naval and air cooperation and assistance as may be requested from the japanese authorities by the council of action now everything was not going well inside mohan singh's own circle also kanan niranjan singh gill who was the right hand man of mohan singh participated in the tokyo conference just to ensure that mohan singh does not get involved or does not commit to the raising of the ina the tokyo conference was over but it was realized that indians from many other countries in that region could not participate it was done pretty quickly so a bigger conference was planned to be held in bangkok towards the end of june on the japanese side there was a change in the liaison agency that was working between the japanese armed forces and the indian national movement which till now was headed by fujiwara and known as fujiwara kikan a new officer was appointed to head the liaison agency the agency was expanded 
into a much bigger one and headed by a new officer, Colonel Hideo Iwakura. And from now onwards, this agency came to be known as the Iwakura Kikan. Providing support to the IIL and raising the INA were part of its brief, but the agency now stressed more on their anti-British propaganda activities rather than on their military action. Representatives of the Indian communities in Japan, Manchukuo, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Philippines, Borneo, Java, Sumatra, Thailand, Malaya, Burma and the Indian prisoners of war met at Bangkok from 15 to 23rd June 1942. The conference received official endorsement from the governments of Japan, Germany and Italy. It also received a message from Subhash Chandra Bose who was in Berlin at that time. The framework constitution of the Tokyo conference was developed into a full one and adopted. Rajberi Bose was elected the first president of the Council of Action, the other members being N. Raghavan, K. P. K. Menon, Mohan Singh and Lieutenant Colonel G. O. Gilani. So the Council of Action had representation from three civilians and two army men. The Bangkok conference decided to raise the INA immediately from the POWs and uh, local civilians and also retained the clauses of conditional support uh, for the Japanese which were adopted in the Tokyo conference. The conference decided that the army that was to be raised should be under full control of the Indians and it should be accorded the powers and status of a free national army of independent India and placed on an equal footing with the Japanese army. The Bangkok conference also asked the Japanese government to allow the Indian Independence League to manage, control and make use of the incomes from the properties of uh, Indians in Burma which were evacuated in 1942. However, in a change from the Tokyo conference, the Bangkok conference decided that the approval of the Indian National Congress was an absolute prerequisite for any military campaign. In May 1942, out of the 55,000 Indian prisoners of war who were handed over to Mohan Singh, 20,000 agreed to join the proposed INA. By the end of August, another 20,000 had agreed. So a total of 40,000 Indian prisoners of war agreed to be a part of the new army. Some of the officers like N.S. Gill and Shanawas Khan joined the INA only with the intention of sabotaging it wrecking it from inside if they felt that the Japanese had any bad intention. This strand of resistance however could not gain any strength because both Gil and Khan were shifted out of Singapore just before the Bangkok conference. Mohan Singh was however quite effective in overcoming challenges to his authority from within the prisoners of war or from the civilian side. At the same time, the rift between Singh and uh, Niranjan Singh Gill was widening. Mohan Singh kept N.S. Gill out of the Council of Action and in his place co-opted Gilani. In the Council of Action, K.P. Kemenan with his deep suspicion about Rajbihari's uh, links with the Japanese becomes an ally of Mohan Singh. The Bangkok Conference decided to appoint Mohan Singh as the General Officer Commanding of the INA. But immediately after the conference, Mohan Singh started acting independently and taking unilateral decisions without consulting the civilian leaders. With the Quit India movement gaining momentum and the Japanese decision to move to and take Northeast Assam, Chittagong, Imphal, Dimapur and Tinsukia, the Iwakura Kikan gave its consent to raise one division of the INA in late August 1942. This division was to be raised from the Indian POWs and armed with captured British arms. Mohan Singh appointed M. Z. Kiani as the Chief of General Staff and gave him the responsibility to organize the INA. Apart from the INA headquarters, Kiani set up one field force regiment and three guerrilla regiments in addition to ancillary and special troops such as the Special Service Group. An officer's training school was also set up. The three guerrilla regiments, Gandhi, Nehru and Azad regiments were commanded by Major I. J. Kiani. Aziz Ahmed and Prakash Chand, while the Field Force Regiment was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel J.K. Bhosle. The Special Services Group was raised in small sections to be attached to the advancing Japanese columns for sabotage and propaganda behind the enemy lines. Shah Khan was put in charge of the officers' training school. 
The first division of the INA was raised with 16,300 officers and men. Subsequently, the efforts to organize the INA gathered momentum rapidly. Mohan Singh agreed with Iwakura to send a part of the division to Burma as an advance party. Forward posts were set up near the Indian frontier in Imphal and Akia areas. At this time, Mohan Singh sought the permission of the Iwakura Kikan to raise a second division. However, Iwakura was not at all certain of Mohan Singh's capability to lead more than a, a division and as a result, he showed no willingness, no intention to accede to his request. In October 1942, a new department was set up within the Iwakura Kikan, which took over the control of not only the prisoners of war who refused to join the INA, but also the surplus INA volunteers who were waiting to be absorbed into the INA. The conflict between the Indians and the Japanese kept escalating. A group of anti-aircraft gunners whom Mohan Singh had lent to the Japanese army were segregated from the Indian camps, given Japanese uniform and put under the direct command of the Japanese officers. Mohan Singh wasn't even permitted to meet them. Another thousand POWs whom he had sent to Thailand for fatigue duty were split up into small groups and placed directly under Japanese officers. In November, officers of the Japanese Special Services Group picked up some students from the Swaraj Institute in Penang, run by N. Raghavan. Raghavan closed down the school in protest and was placed under house arrest. When N. S. Gill came back from the Burma front, he reported that the advance party which was sent by Mohan Singh to Burma had also received the same treatment as the gunners. They were placed under the command of the Japanese officers. Not only that, Gill reported that the Japanese had planned to put the INA troops under their direct command when they reached Burma. Many similar incidents have been happening which pointed to the fact that the Japanese wanted the IIL and the planned INA to be subservient to their overall interests. In view of these circumstances, Mohan Singh informed Iwakura that before contemplating further action on the planned troop movement to Burma, the matter had to be referred to the COA for its uh, approval. Sensing that the Council of Action was more likely to decide against the proposed troop movement, the Japanese brought on tremendous pressure on Mohan Singh. But Mohan Singh remained adamant. He refused to budge. On 29th November, the Council of Action issued a memorandum to the government of Japan. The memorandum said, We have now reached a stage at which we feel that before we take any further forward move, it is necessary to clear matters to understand our position perfectly. The memorandum raised four specific issues. Firstly, the government of Japan should clarify their attitude towards the resolutions of the Bangkok Conference. Secondly, the Council of Action should be recognized as the supreme executive of the Indian independence movement in East Asia. Third, a full formal solemn declaration should be made by the government of Japan regarding their intention to recognize the absolute independence of India. And finally, the formation and existence of the Indian National Army should be formally and publicly recognized. On receiving this memorandum, Iwakuro showed his reluctance to forward it to the government of Japan and called a joint conference between the Council of Action and the Aikikan. The joint conference took place on the 1st of December 1942. Iwakuro told the Council of Action that if the INA is to be used for military purposes in India, it is better to keep it a secret. The Japanese decision was to announce the existence of the INA when the military operation started. Similarly, Iwakura argued that the Indian independence declaration should be announced only when its political impact would be the greatest. However, he assured the Council of Action that he would take up the issues with the government of Japan. With this, all understandings between the Council of Action and the Iwakura Kikan broke down. However, to be fair, it should be mentioned that the Japanese government had been trying with the German and the Italian governments for a tripartite declaration on Indian independence. Although Japan and uh, Italy were ready by this time, it was Hitler who had formed the stumbling block. After the breakdown of these negotiations, the Council of Action decided on 4th December 
that there would be no troop movement to Burma. While the tension between the Indians and the Japanese escalated, no unity could be attained within the Indian camp either. The civilian leaders of Southeast Asia, along with their suspicion for the Japanese intentions, were also uncomfortable with the concentration of power in the hands of Mohan Singh. They opposed the raising of the INA before the Indian Independence League was formally recognized by the Japanese government. They were greatly annoyed by the fact that Mohan Singh had made the INA volunteers take a pledge to him personally. They believed that Mohan Singh had used cruel measures for recruitment in the INA and that he had promised to the Japanese government that he would cooperate with them in every possible manner if they did away with the IIL and help him raise a force of 200,000. Mohan Singh's propensity to deal with the liaison agency unilaterally added strength to the circulation of these rumors. His agreement for troop movement to Burma some time back was one such example of his unilateral decisions. Protesting against Mohan Singh's raising the INA and uh, the, his unilateral decision to send troops to Burma, N. Raghavan, one of the members of the Council of Action, submitted his resignation. In response, the Council of Action tried to get the INA under civilian control. They decided all questions relating to the administration, finances and troop movement of the INA should first go to the President of the Council of Action, which is Rashbihari Bose, and be deliberated with the Council of Action. Mohan Singh, Gilani and Menon used this situation to precipitate the crisis. They demanded a written assurance from Iwakuro that he would forward the resolutions of 29th November to the government of Japan and get a declaration on Indian independence before the end of December. Now both these conditions were quite impossible to meet at that time. Iwakuro had made it clear that he would not forward the demands of 29th November to the government because they sounded like an ultimatum. He preferred a way of negotiation, discussion and to move forward through them. And on the second point, it was practically impossible to put a timeline, that too only of a few weeks, to get a declaration on Indian independence from the government of Japan. After these demands were raised, Raj Bihari, Iwakuro, Raghavan and Fujiwara met on 7th December to salvage the situation. Fujiwara and Iwakuro expressed the suspicion that Mohan Singh might have come under the influence of a fifth columnist who was trying to wreck the movement. Immediately after this meeting, Rajbihari and Iwakuro take three decisions jointly. First, that the INA would be disarmed and its general officer commanding Mohan Singh would be removed from its command. Second, the present council of action would be dissolved. And third, NS Gill and Mohan Singh would be kept under arrest till the situation is brought under control. These terms were forwarded to the headquarters of the Southern Army under Terauchi, who approved and later helped in executing these terms. Lieutenant Colonel N.S. Gill was arrested the very next day on the charges of espionage. When Rajbiri informed Mohan Singh that the terms which he had put forward were not acceptable, Mohan Singh, Menon and Gilani resigned from the Council of Action. Rajbiri tried to contact the officers of the INA but was prevented by Mohan Singh. Both Mohan Singh and Gilani portrayed this as encroachment into their area of authority. In a countermeasure, Mohan Singh challenged Rajbihari Bose's authority because with the resignation of four members, the Council of Action did not exist anymore. But in the overall context, by breaking away from the nationalist movement in East Asia and by claiming the loyalty of the INA volunteers personally to himself, Mohan Singh had tried to create a position which was untenable. On 21st December, Mohan Singh met the senior officers of the INA and circulated a sealed order among the unit commanders. The order said, the Indian National Army will be dissolved shortly. A confirmatory order will be sent out as soon as arrangement with the Nepponese are complete. In the event of my being separated from you before such an order is issued, the dissolution will take place automatically and immediately. Also at the same time, the resignation of all the members of the INA and their release from all obligations and undertakings to me and the INA will be taken for granted. 
on 29th december mohan singh was called to the office of the iwakura kikan and uh, offered term under which he could continue in his office but mohan singh refused to accept those terms he was immediately shown a letter from rajbihari bos dismissing him from the command rajbihari's letter raised four charges against mohan singh that singh disobeyed the president's direction to send up certain iron officers to meet him singh was attempting to create a private and personal army of the ina thirdly having cut himself off from the indian independence movement in east asia singh could no longer command the army which belonged to the movement and lastly singh had willfully and maliciously attempted to spread discontent and disaffection among the members of the army of the indian independence movement of east asia immediately after his dismissal mohan singh was taken into custody by the japanese military police the ina troops were disarmed the dream of an armed movement to liberate india from foreign rule was almost over but then rash bihari bose stepped in he formed a committee of administrators for administering discipline amongst the ina personnel the chairperson of the committee was lieutenant colonel jk bosley the other members being lieutenant colonel mz khiani lieutenant colonel loganathan and major prakash chand this committee succeeded to a great extent in removing the suspicion regarding rash bihari bose by holding joint meetings and also separate meetings amongst the ncos the commissioned officers and others on 4th february 1943 prime minister tojo announced that japan had no territorial ambitions on india and it would provide an all out assistance to see india free two days later on 6th february rash bihari put forward a proposal to the ikkan for reforming the ina the ina was to be directly under the control of the iil to be formed on a voluntary basis and to be governed by the indian national army act which was to be drafted by the council of action matters relating to the administration and operations of the ina were to be dealt directly by a new department called military bureau within the indian independence league the ina was to have the same status as the allied armies of japan iwakuro accepted these terms on the very same day however they were still not ready to put the pows the prisoners under the command of the goc of ina they still had to be under japanese control iwakuro communicated that the japanese government had accepted the bangkok resolutions in principle but a declaration cannot be made on that because the indian independence league was an organization it was not a state when rashbihari bose circulated a questionnaire to the officers in the ina regarding their opinion to whether to continue in the ina or not he found that practically all the officers are prepared to fight and sacrifice for the freedom of our motherland but not everyone is ready to continue within the ina now Iwakuro convened a meeting of these officers. He urged them to join or continue in the INA, but to no avail. In a subsequent heart-to-heart -heart talk with some of these officers, Iwakuro found that a large number of these officers were ready to continue on the express condition that Japan would do everything in its power to bring Subhash Chandra Bose to Singapore. Both Iwakuro and Rashbihari accepted these conditions. when the new chief of the second bureau of the imperial general headquarters lieutenant general arisu visited singapore rash bihari requested him to make immediate arrangements to bring over subhash chandra bose on his return to tokyo lieutenant general arisu immediately takes it up with the german government in a joint conference held between 27th and 30th april between the leaders of the indian communities in southeast asia and those of of the army The new constitution of the Indian Independence League was announced. Rashbihari announced that he expected Subhash to be in Southeast Asia very soon and that he would be Rashbihari's successor. It would be pertinent to mention here that despite its composite culture, its unifying nature, there was a concern which was communal in nature towards the beginning. We find it from the writings of MZ Kiani that some of the muslim officers were affected by the pakistan movement within india they were distrustful of the hindus 
and they were pretty apprehensive of being led not only led but having to put their everything in the hands of a Sikh leader one of the key factors which helped them overcome this apprehension and go forward with the INA was the assurance that Suhas Bose would come over to Southeast Asia and take charge of the entire movement. They had complete faith in that one man. This is Suhas Chandra Bose speaking to Indians in East Asia.